I'm Carol Klein, and this is my home plebe cottage. When I'm not presenting or writing about gardening, this is where I spend most of my time, and where I've been honing my horticultural skills for 40 years. Whether you've got a spacious plot, a tiny patio, or a few window boxes, there's nothing more exciting and satisfying than creating your own garden. From basic to more advanced techniques, I believe anyone can learn how to do it. Whether you're a complete novice or an experienced gardener, I want to help you develop the skills to make your garden grow. I'm ready. Are you? In this program, I want to show you how to make a happy and successful garden by following Mother Nature herself. Whether your garden's sunny or shady, dry or damp, we'll see how nature teaches us how to put the right plants in the right places and help them be the very best they can. Growing plants and putting them together successfully isn't automatic. It's something you learn gradually. My passion for gardening started to show itself from the age of two, growing up in Manchester. It followed me from north to south, where I met my husband, Neil, and eventually we came to Glebe Cottage. I remember the first time I saw this cottage. That would have been the, the summer of 1978, quite a long time ago now. It was idyllic, but there was no garden at all. It was just a great big piece where you turn cars round. At last, here in Devon, I found what I was looking for, but that was just a start. During the subsequent 40 years, Neil and I have transformed this unprepossessing patch into our idea of paradise. And we had a wonderful teacher. I think by far the most successful gardener ever is Mother Nature. And I think it's worth looking at what Mother Nature does and what she grows in each different situation when you're deciding what to do with your own garden. The big lesson we learned when we were developing our garden is that each area has its own natural conditions that must be taken into account. For instance, one side's open and sunny, so we laid out an area that really captures the sun and planted it up a bit like a meadow. The other side is shady, so that became our woodland garden. And to plant them up successfully, we looked at what thrives in the natural equivalents. This is a meadow. We've got grasses mixed with perennials and annuals all coming up together in glorious company. Lots of our gardens, our beds and borders are very similar in lots of ways. We planted the meadowy, sunny parts of the garden with the kind of plants that would do well in a real meadow habitat, and they flourished. This Astrantia, for example, is a plant that just loves meadowy conditions. It grows cheek by jowl with other plants, and that's something that all these plants have in common. They love company. They also love a real open, exposed sort of place where the sun can beat down on them, they can receive all the rain. Other meadowy favorites in here are these gorgeous geraniums living happily alongside the lace flower or layer grandiflora. It's a sure sign the right plant in the right place. There's also a boggy area in the garden with a pond. So we took our cue from natural wetlands and put in plants that have evolved to thrive in watery conditions. But my favorite condition of all is shade. I'm very drawn to the magic and mystery of a woodland. By now, the predominant color is green. But what greens? All these different shapes of foliage 
splashes of silver too from things like the brunner and, and then there are splashes of color from some of the shrubs azaleas and rhododendrons if we look at the conditions here and we look at the plants that thrives that gives us all the clues we need to know what to grow in our shady places and to underline what i mean by choosing the plants that will suit your conditions i'm going to show you how to plant up a container that will perfectly suit any shady spot. Now, lots of people have shady places in their garden. I mean, it can be shade created by anything. It can be the house, the garage, round the back by the wheelie bins, you know, by your back door. And sometimes it's really lovely to think about having a container there and making a real merit of that shade. And the plants I'm going to use are very, very straightforward. So I want to start with a fern, because of all plants, ferns are the most typical of woodland or shady areas. I've chosen it because it's an evergreen fern. And if you've only got a small garden and your ferns go to sleep during the winter, it's a bit of a disappointment, so it's a good idea to go for one that's evergreen. I fill this container with a loam based compost. That just means a compost that includes soil. And then, to help give these plants the very best start, I'm adding something called leaf mold. This is just made from fallen leaves I've collected and allowed to rot down. I'm only going to put a bit in because I've got a lot of plants to get in there. Do you have this one, Fifi? I'm gently breaking up the roots at the bottom of the plant so they can settle into the compost. And then I scoop out planting holes and gently push in the plants. When they're in position, I'll top the compost up until all the plants are firmly covered up to the base of their stems. So alongside this, let's have one of these euphorbias. It's not bonny with these lovely reddish leaves. Euphorbias are a wonderful group of plants, sometimes called spurges. There are types to suit all conditions. This one's perfect for dry shade. These flowers, or bracts as they are, the tiny flowers inside them, will persist for ages and ages. Gradually they'll go a deeper green. Eventually you can cut them back down to the base. Be careful when you do, though, because all spurges have this kind of milky sap that can actually irritate and burn your skin. Um, but don't be put off by that. <laughs> the added bonus of woodland plants is that once they've planted, they'll usually look after themselves. I won't need to feed them at all because they're woodland plants, so they're used to just spreading these fine roots out backwards and forwards and living in close proximity to each other, of course. It's not what you call a very artistic arrangement, but I think it will look really lovely with the contrast of these, these purpley leaves and then these big bright bracts. It's a lot better than looking at your wheelie bin, isn't it? All that remains is to water well, and then sit back to admire your own slice of woodland, ready to bring life into a shady corner of your garden or balcony. We've looked at how to make the best use of the different natural conditions you might have in your garden, and now I want to show you how to get your head round the dizzying range of plants you can choose to grow there. When you're learning how to garden, having identified what kind of soil and situation you've got the next bit is a really exciting bit. What are the plant elements you want to include in your garden to really make the most of it? 
Well, the very, very first one, and by far the most important, is a tree. Perhaps all you've got is a balcony garden, but you can still grow a tree. But for most of us, even in small spaces, there are trees we can choose that will bring structure, shape, solidity and permanence to our plantings. Some of us are fearful of planting trees, especially if our space is limited. We worry they might get too big and take over the garden. But trees make a wonderful feature. You just need to choose the right one. The smaller your garden, the more you need from your tree. So you want to choose something that's got great foliage, wonderful flowers if possible, fantastic fruit and gorgeous autumn colour. You're not asking much, are you? What's more, a tree can be extremely wildlife friendly. I want to plant one that will feed the bees and birds. And this is what I've chosen. It's a crab apple and it's called Everest. But you can still see loads of these small crab apples actually sitting amongst the branches. And they will turn amber, peachy coloured, orange, glorious. And what's more, they last on the tree long after the leaves have fallen. Look for something that's got a nice straight trunk. You don't want anything that's got a list to starboard. Most garden centres or nurseries will have a tree to suit your garden. Do some research before you choose. Now to find the right spot. You want to choose a site where you know a tree is going to grow and be happy. So I've chosen a site which is fairly open, lovely soil, really good. And even if you haven't got a garden, you can grow your trees in a big container. Make sure that it's as big as you can possibly manage and feed it regularly with some organic liquid feed. And that way it should establish well and give you absolutely years of pleasure. And what's more, if you move house, you might be able to take your tree with you. But I'm planting this tree in the ground. So first, I need to dig the right sized hole. Look at your pot. You want to try and make a, a space that's about two or three times bigger. You don't need to dig deep, only deep enough to accommodate that pot. But you do need to prepare the soil around about because tree roots are going to spread outwards. So that's vitally important if this is going to get off to a flying start. Once the hole is as deep as the pot, it's time to make sure it's just right. Oh, how about that? I never expected that. This actually fits. Yeah. Now for a final check. And you've got to absolutely ensure, just use a fork or a spade or a bamboo cane, that that root ball is level with the soil around. And I think that's just about right. Gosh. Fill in with soil and jiggle it around to make sure there are no air pockets. And you're almost there. Putting the boot in. So that's what it needs. Your tree shouldn't need staking if you've planted it properly. It doesn't matter if it's waist this way and that, as long as those roots aren't moving, because that's what roots are for, they're to hold it in place. I think that's not bad, really. Are you happy? I think so. All this new tree needs is a really good soak. And then daily watering for the first couple of weeks. It'll be a great addition to this part of the garden. And the birds and the bees will love it too. So if you want to know how to plant a tree, dig a hole two to three times as wide as a pot. Check the depth is correct and backfill with soil. Firm in and water thoroughly. Next on my list of plant elements is a huge group of woody plants, second only to trees in size and longevity. Oh. 
Well, another really important element in all our gardens is shrubs. This is one. <laughs> it's a doitzia with these lovely single pink flowers. And it's very, very good for bees. They absolutely love it. Other pollinating insects too will visit. But there are so many different shrubs and there's one to please absolutely everybody. The reason that shrubs form such a vital element in your garden is because, first of all, just like trees, they're a permanent structure. They're always visible right through the year, whether they've got leaves or not. The other reason is that they, they're hugely various. You get all manner of different shapes and sizes, the most beautiful range of flowers, lots and lots of perfume and scent from them, even in the middle of winter. One of my favorite shrubs in our garden is this silvery Aliagnus with its gorgeous scent. It's a bee magnet. Then there's a wonderfully named smoke bush, which lights up the garden. Planting most shrubs is exactly the same as planting a tree. What do you do when you've planted them and they've started to grow up in your garden? What happens if they get a bit straggly or you've got dead and diseased damaged wood within them? Well, you prune it. Judicious pruning is an important way to keep shrubs healthy and in good shape. Serious pruning where you cut away hard should be done in late winter or early spring. Right now, at the end of spring, however, it's fine to do a little light titivation to improve your plant's looks. This is the best tool for things like this, a lopper. First of all, take a really good look at it. Look at its silhouette. I can see most of these branches are endowed with these lovely pink flowers, but here and there, there's dead growth. Now that, yeah, and then move in with these and make a nice clean cut here. Once you've cut out the larger dead branches, snip out the smaller twigs with some secateurs. Look at this, lovely flowers at the end of these shoots, but look at all this dead wood here. So you just want to snip this out. Make sure you're snipping the dead wood first. Sharp secateurs are an imperative when you're doing this. And every single plant has its own character, and that's what you want to maintain. So if you see things that are growing at a strange angle that just don't look right, get rid of them and be brave. We prune shrubs for these three reasons. To improve their shape and encourage fresh growth, to remove any dead, dying or diseased wood, and to help the plant stay healthy. A very important role for shrubs in the garden is as boundaries or hedges. This is a particularly popular choice. It's box, and it allows us gardeners to get specially creative. Well, box is also a shrub, but in this case, it's one you don't prune in the usual way. Just trim the new growth like this using sharp shears or garden scissors. If you do it twice a year, in June and then again in the autumn, it'll keep your box neat. This is exactly the right time to prune box. They say Derby Day, so sort of early June or something like that. I don't know really, I've never been to the Derby. People usually want to change their box or you into topiary just by clipping away to create all sorts of forms and structures. It, you can really let your imagination run wild. I've got a good friend who used to be a hairdresser, but he gave it all up because he went into topiary. And really, the two are the same. And they both regrow, so if you make mistakes, you can always have another go at it. Box forms a great big sort of undulating hedge right the way across these two borders. It kind of joins them together. And it's an example of cloud pruning. Cloud pruning is a, it's a Japanese, I don't know whether it's gardening or an art form. It's a bit of both. And so often in gardening, things are a combination of those. 
The Japanese are very, very interested in observing nature, and they often let us inform the way they garden. With cloud pruning, it's a question of looking at clouds and trying to sort of emulate those lovely, soft, billowing shapes. You can start your own box hedge with a tray of smaller plants or by taking cuttings. In an open position and with well-watered soil, they'll grow steadily year by year. Shrubs are such a wonderful group of plants. It's a great shame not to have them if you haven't got a garden or you've only got a tiny space. But help is at hand. You can grow shrubs very, very happily in containers. I've chosen this Philadelphus. So its common name is Mock Orange and that's because it's got the most beautiful perfume just like orange blossom. And it's lovely in the sunshine, but be even better in the evening. As you're sitting out there with a cool glass of wine, that perfume will float everywhere around you. When you're buying your shrub, don't be frightened to demand to see its roots. Just take it out of its pot and have a look. Because you don't really want to be buying a shrub whose roots are going round and round. That means it's pot bound and it's going to take it a long time to establish wherever you're going to plant it out. So the best thing to do, since we're growing this one in a container, is to put it into something bigger. Now I'm going to use this pot. It's full of crocs. Crocs are just broken bits of pot that help the compost drain efficiently. You don't have to have these. But since it's eventually going to end up in this ornamental container, which hasn't got any drainage in the bottom, that will mean it's never going to sit in stagnant water. So, first stage is compost. I've used compost in there, which is based on loam. All loam is, is soil, but it's sterilised, so I won't get any weeds growing in there. But the closer it is to soil, the better that plant's going to get away. If you're using one of these heat-free compost or multi-purpose. They're great to start plants off, but they're no good for long-term growth. I think this is a lovely place to have it. And the light in the evening is really low here, so that white will glow. So it just remains to give it a really, really thorough watering. And I'll water it regularly for the next couple of weeks, make sure it's always kept moist. Because that will just encourage those roots to move out and for it to establish happily in its pot. Once I've grown something, I feel extremely responsible for it. I think that whole thing of nurturing is something that all people have it in common, but it's very marked in a lot of gardeners, this need to look after things and to help them to do their best. The absolute mainstays of the flower bed or border are herbaceous perennials. Herbaceous means the plant doesn't have a woody stem, like a tree or shrub. It dies back and retreats into the ground each winter. Perennial means it comes back year after year. Today, they're every gardener's best friends. Isn't this scrumptious? You could just eat this middle, couldn't you? It's like some kind of confection. It's a peony, and it's a peony called Bowl of Beauty. It belongs to a, a group of peonies called Peonia lactiflora, and they're part of a bigger group, which are all herbaceous. In other words, they die right down at the end of the season, and then up they come the next spring. And when you plant peonies, never plant them too deep. They've got tuberous roots, and those want to be just under the surface of the soil. Water them well and occasionally give them a real treat, give them a bit of organic fertiliser, preferably in liquid form. These are amongst the longest lived of all herbaceous perennials. 
Sometimes people have got patches of pain as it they can remember from when their grandmas were growing them and they're still carrying on and going strong. And really nothing surpasses them for this pure beauty and these gorgeous voluptuous flowers. I'm Carol Klein, and I've been gardening at my home, Glebe Cottage in Devon, for more than 40 years. Whatever the size or conditions of your outdoor space, I want to show you how to choose and care for the plant elements you can use to make a garden. Another really important element in our gardens is sometimes overlooked. It's climbers. Sometimes we forget about how much space there is to exploit by plants that grow upwards. There are all sorts of climbers from all over the world and many of them can grow very, very successfully in our gardens. On the east end of our little cottage are two of the most magnificent climbers. This one, Wisteria. My wisteria is almost over, but it does combine so beautifully with the other climber I've planted here, which is a white climbing hydrangea. It climbs where it comes from, way up into tall trees, because climbers usually grow in places where they've got to find the light, they've got to explore. So up they come. Hydrangea petiolaris, on the other hand, this lovely climbing hydrangea, which is really easy to grow and very very suitable for awkward places like north and east walls attaches itself to its host by means of these little adventitious roots this photo shows how this walls changed from stone and brick to a sea of leaf and bloom you could do the same by growing something along a garden wall or the back of a garage and either of these could be planted in a large container trained along a fence or through the rails of a balcony. Well, I suppose these two climbers are rather grand, especially for a little cottage like ours, but they're lovely. But there are all sorts of different climbers that you can use in your garden and all sorts of ways of supporting them too. Clematis is another favourite climber of mine. And who doesn't love climbing roses? In my garden, I've planted a Paul's Himalayan musk, which climbs through my favourite cornice. Right now in the veggie garden, the scent of another really popular climber is filling the air. One climber that lots of us love to grow, and I certainly do, is the sweet pea. I, I'm waiting in anticipation both for the sight of them, but really for the scent, because they are amongst the most perfumed of flowers. Sow them in spring in modules or pots, or you can sow them directly into the ground. And you can carry on sowing them really right into late summer. Your flowers will be later, but who cares? They're worth waiting for. Sweet peas are an annual plant, which means you grow them from seed every year. You can buy seeds or a tray of small plants very cheaply. When they're about six inches tall, pop them in the soil. All along these poles are many different colours of sweet peas, but perhaps this is my favourite, and it's called Cupani, after the Italian monk who first sent seed of it to this country. All sweet peas like it's sunny. Here I'm growing them amongst peas and beans. But to get them started, you usually use something like bamboo poles. I'm using these stout hazels here. And you tie them in, first of all, just with a bit of string, just to get them heading in the right direction. But if you want masses of flowers, there's one thing that you have to do. And it's no hardship. You just have to keep on cutting them. Take them indoors and enjoy that perfume. I bet everybody who grows sweet peas grows them because that smell reminds them of some time or some person. They remind me of my mum. She absolutely loved them. And even in her tiny little garden, 
you to always grow a few plants. Bring them in to the house. I grow most of my sweet peas in the borders, but they're perfectly happy growing in a large container. That means you can put a pot anywhere you've got a sunny spot. And there's another climber I love. It rises early, making it an ideal companion if you're having a morning cuppa on the back doorstep. The plant I've chosen is this. Isn't it glorious? It is glorious. It's morning glory. It's a good job that I'm showing it to you early on in the day because these flowers will close in the afternoon. Its proper name is Ipomea. It needs practically no sustenance whatsoever. It's the easiest thing in the world to grow. These morning glory will be fine growing in a container like this big square pot. I grew them from seed just like the sweet peas and I'm combining them with this grass which loves the same sunny conditions. So they'd be really happy together. To get them started, all you do is make a hole as deep as the pot and pop in the plant, making sure the compost is level with the pot. So I'm going to put each one in a corner of this and maybe have two additional ones. It will climb right up to the top of here and you can see how it climbs. It just twirls itself around. Just like the sweet peas, they need something to climb up. So I'm using these poles, but bamboo canes would do just as well. I hope that's going to be successful. I think it will. This part of the garden really needed some extra height and that's definitely going to give it that. It's lovely to be imaginative with your climbers too and to think of different ways to use them. I think I might use this idea again. For me, this is one of the real joys of gardening. You're constantly learning new things. Your plot becomes a place to practice. I think what's so lovely about gardening is that it gives everybody an opportunity to express themselves. I mean, how often do you get that in modern life? Getting creative in the garden is the most inspiring thing of all. And I've got an exciting new project in mind right now. Many people have been seduced recently by exotic indoor plants with rich glossy leaves and striking foliage. But I want to show you a bit of outdoor exotica. This is an ideal project for a patio or balcony. Whenever you're planting a container, or absolutely anywhere, but particularly with containers, because you're going to view them usually on all sides. So it's really important to imagine what the whole thing's going to look like when it starts growing. Many of these plants come from the tropics and look like they ought to be indoors, but they'll be happy outside all summer long. I think they'll make a fantastic combination. I think even at this stage, just as a, a combination of foliage, I think they look really quite nice. There's this Rechinus grown from seed. It's a castor oil plant. Isn't it lovely with those big dark leaves? But the other elements in here are all either bulbs, as in the case of these Eucomis, this most gorgeous, I think this is called sparkling burgundy. Um, and Eucomis come from South Africa, grow up and high ledges, real baking sun, so it's going to love living here. And then right in the centre, it's a dahlia, everybody will recognise it. One of the most popular plants in British gardens, although it's had a very mixed history, but nowadays everybody puts them into their beds and borders and really celebrates with them. Dahlias come from Mexico and South America. This one's Magenta Star. Its flowers shine brightly into autumn above its dark leaves. I'm using a plastic tree tub, standing inside a decorative copper pot. I've already half filled it with multi-purpose compost. Right, is that fairly straight? Looks reasonably happy. And then I can start in filling with these. Um, it's got some organic fertiliser in it too, which will keep these things going for a bit. 
To complement the delightful dahlia, I'm using a canna. Their large leaves really give that jungly look. I bet people think I'm really rough with my plants, but um, I never hurt them. I promise. I haven't had any complaints yet. Right. Not only do they have these leaves, which are going to become really quite enormous and look wonderful with the light shining through them. You see the silhouettes of the other leaves in there. But as if that wasn't enough, they produce these flowers and they're just like the silk handkerchiefs from a magician's hat. They just grow and grow and grow in glorious colours. Even if you've got a small garden, you fill it with these sorts of plants and have climbers growing overhead. You can just pretend you're way out in the middle of the jungle. On a blazing June day, it seems fitting to be planting something with a touch of the tropics. But it's thirsty work. Oh, sorry. Coffee. Fifi, come on. Come on. <laughs> it's hard we get a chance to do any gardening, isn't it? Hey, Fee, you like the garden, don't you? Time spent just sitting in the garden with Neil is really precious. As we learn how to garden, we should always remember how to enjoy it as well. People, especially non-gardeners, often refer to gardening as a hobby. But of course, whether you've got a plot as big as mine or whether you've got a window box and a few plants, it's much, much more than that. Because you always have a relationship with your plants. You love them. Sometimes you get fed up with them if they're not doing quite what you wanted them to do. You're important to them, but even more than that, they're vital to you. Seeing your garden grow is a real thrill. Whether it's pots of flowers on your patio or vegetables in a raised bed, this pleasure is one of the reasons for my love of gardening. People have been growing vegetables for so long that, of course, there's all sorts of folklore and all sorts of lovely stories attached to growing veg and I'm going to put in here something that I've read about, heard about. It's called the Three Sisters Bed and it's something which the Iroquois tribe, the women of course, because they grew all the veg. And the whole idea was that it exploited three plants which were really great for them because not only could you eat them fresh but you could also store them. This is a story of three vegetables that benefit from growing intimately together. So the very first element would have been sweet corn. So I started these sweet corn about, probably about six weeks ago. Last year we had a total disaster. Look at those roots, aren't they lovely? And um, a pheasant got into the greenhouse and at the lot. I think he left me about three or four plants, but um, don't really mix pheasants and gardening. These sweet corn plants started life as seed. I grew them in my greenhouse and now they're ready to plant in a hole as deep as the pot. So a nice open place in sunshine, any soil at all, really easy. And straightforward. The next sister is a climbing bean, which will wrap itself around the tall corn eventually. So you can use any kind of beans to do this. They would probably have used something that would store really well, something that's a bit more like a, a butter bean. I'm going to use, because I want to eat the pods rather than store the beans, so I'm going to use um, a bean called 
Santa Ana. So it's got cylindrical pods. And one of them actually, I think it's this one, might be one called Maraviglia di Venice. So it's got yellow flat pods. It's a lovely bean. So many different kinds you can try. Anyway, I'll shut up and get on with it. I grew the beans from seed as well, but you can buy young plants from a nursery or garden centre. In Italian, they call these beans rampicante. <laughs> that really describes how they're just all over the show. Like my sweet peas, each bean has a cane for support to help start its climb. The final three, sister, is this one. It's a pumpkin, could be a squash, doesn't matter. But what you want here is one that's going to really spread itself around. That's exactly what they do. And the reason this was included as one of the three sisters is that she does a very important job. She actually covers the ground, shading it, retaining moisture underneath, which you'd really need in a, a baking hot summer. Also, as a bonus, produces these wonderful fruit. All that remains is to plant the final member of this tasty trio. In about two to three months' time, depending on the summer and the weather we get, we'll be able to harvest for the first time. I mean, who do you garden for? I garden hugely for myself. It's very self-indulgent. I just love the doing of it and the growing of it. But I'm constantly aware of how important my garden is to all those creatures that I share it with. Some of them are very visible and you can hear them too, the wonderful song of birds that permeates the air through the spring and right into the winter. For my final project, I'm going to put together a pot for a patio. It'll be perfect for our wildlife friends to feast on. Pale blue scabious, purple wallflowers, and the blue geranium. They're all magnets for bees and butterflies. I thought it would be really nice just to gather together a, a real mishmash of all sorts of different plants. Some are perennials, a couple of annuals, some vegetables too, and make a, a kind of rainbow planting. <laughs> so it's a bit of a tribute to the NHS. I think all these things are going to live happily. There'll be a real kind of community of plants. It's a real privilege to garden. I think that it ought to be a top priority for every single kid in the entire country to actually be able to get their hands in the soil. It's such an important part of every kid's education, really, to learn about the living world and which better way to find out about it than to garden. I've been asked before, you know, what I'd do if I didn't have a garden, if I couldn't garden. And I cannot imagine what it would be like. It's not the meaning of life, but it's a reason to get up, go out.
next time, I'm going to show you how to propagate all your own plants from scratch. Every time you sow a seed, it's an act of faith. How to bring them up and look after them as well. Then, in you go with your chopstick. We've all had plants we've loved the look of that just didn't make it. Well, if you know how to grow your own plants and nurture them, that need never happen again. Just be sure to come along with me on our gardening adventure. It's the start of a wonderful process and hugely exciting.